Hey, I was. Uh, I had a sermon um, already lined out and for this week, and it was called "Take the Plunge." And I've been working on it for a while, and um, this week God changed that. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with God having His way. And God, um, you know, basically, if you've got something prepared and it's something that, that you're working on, it'll wait for another week. If God wants to change it, He can change it. Amen? And, and this week I got a text um, from, um, you know, from a friend. And the text was basically um, one of those eye-openers to me as a Christian. It was one of those eye-openers in a way that I could not only uh, relate to what he was feeling, I was, could relate to how sometimes I act. And sometimes how I know that no matter if you're a Christian, we all act this way at times. Um, and it's basically being a Christian, I'll give you the, the scenario, is he felt that he was being a Christian, but there was a situation that he knew that we hadn't acted, he hadn't acted, and we hadn't done anything about, and, and it even went as far as the saying, how can I be a Christian and not do nothing about this situation that I know is happening? And, you know, I took that, and, and I was thinking, wow, that's pretty impactful. And we talked back and forth through texting, and, and this week, uh, the, you know, the sermon that I have, uh, the title of it is called Justifying My Path. Um, because I believe that a lot of times we can justify the path that we're on and it works for us. No matter if it's working for everybody else, we can sometimes justify where we're at, what we're doing, who we're affected, how we help or how we don't help. We can justify a lot of things. All right? I only got one right. Right? Right. right. And, and it's easy to do that because I mean, I, I, I run into a lot of Christians, folks, that, that, you know, I got some people that are over here doing this and I know some people that are over here doing this and sometimes they don't always, you know, act or, 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 or think the life, and, but they both love the Lord and there's a lot of justifying our actions that goes into play there. And so I found some scripture this week, and, and I'm going to tell you, uh, many of you have heard about the Good Samaritan. Many of you have heard the parable that Jesus told. Many of you have read it. You've heard sermons on it. Um, you know, but this week I believe that God has showed me some, some things that are in here deeper than I ever even imagined. And I'm just going to start reading um, you know, the, the verses as we go along. And I'm going to stop a little bit here and there, but I just want you to listen closely to what Jesus is telling someone that's considered an expert, okay? Listen, in Luke 10, 25, it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Now, I'm going to stop there for one second because I'm going to tell you, anybody that's considered an expert in something typically has a method or a mindset that they are good. They know what it takes to do whatever they're experienced in, whatever they're an expert in, that they know everything that there's a know about it. Um, there's, there's a level in position and education you can get to as a doctorate level where you are very confident in whatever you trained in. And this guy was an expert in the law. He knew what, what, what the law said. He had very well skilled enough to where he was feeling, I'm going to test this guy called Jesus based on the law, based on, you know, if he's really from God, if, if, if he's really sent by God, this is, you know, he wanted to test him and his knowledge. And it says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I'm going to tell you, that's a question that many people have. No matter if you're saved or, or, or not saved, there's many times you question your own salvation. And if you say you've never questioned your salvation, I would say you probably got saved like last Sunday or something. And because there's been times even in my walk where I'm like, man, I know the thought that just ran through my head. I'm just like, Lord, am I good? I mean, I'm sorry, I repent. And, and you know, but at, at times we want to know, are we saved? But what must a person do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? See, sometimes we read the Bible and, and a lot of times our interpretation of what we're reading determines our actions or what we do. And he, he knew that, so he's asking the guy, how do you read it? And the guy answers back, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And listen to this, you have answered correctly Jesus replied, Do this and you will live. 
But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Now I'm going to read the rest of the scripture here in just a second, but there's two words that I want you to remember here. I want you to remember the word expert, and I want you to remember justify. Expert and justify. Now let's go to the next set of verses. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and went away, uh, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going by down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put uh, the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and, and took care of him. The next day, he took out a denarii and gave uh, them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for what extra expenses you have. Which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? This is Jesus asking. The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now folks, I'm going to tell you, when you're told by uh, Jesus to go and do likewise, it means that whatever story he just told you has great impact. And, and literally, uh, this guy... I guarantee you, when he heard Jesus tell him what Jesus had told him about this parable, this guy was probably forever changed, and I'm not sure that anybody sitting in here, nor me up until about a week ago, fully understood the story, the story of the Good Samaritan. Most of the time you've heard of things like the Samaritan's Purse, well, it operates a Christmas child, right? Uh, a lot of times you, you hear the word Samaritan, and it's not a negative view in your mind. There's not something that you're saying, well, wow, that, that just, you know, okay, a priest and a Levite and a Samaritan, okay, well, one guy showed pity. Well, most of the time we read a story or read something out of the Bible, and unless we know the culture, unless we know the people, a lot of times that story doesn't ring like it would have rang for who Jesus was actually talking to. And I'm going to tell you, this impacted that guy's life. I guarantee it. It would have had to. Because I'm going to tell you, for every person that goes to church, for every person that calls himself godly, for this expert in the law, Jesus, what he did was like picked up mud pie and smashed it right into this person's face and said, who showed pity? Because it wasn't the godly crowd who showed pity. It was the guy that the godly crowd hates. Right? So my, my point one is, listen, we can justify how much we love or how much love we think we are giving to God. But loving others as much as ourselves is very easy to see through our actions. And, and what I mean by that is we justify a lot. You ever heard somebody say, you don't know what I've been through? You don't know what I'm going through? Uh, you know, well, you, you need to forgive this person, or you need to do this, or you need to do that. And, and, and a lot of times we justify our emotions, we justify our actions, we justify what we do by how we feel. When necessarily loving your neighbor as yourself has nothing to do with justifying. It's just saying, is your actions going to show who you're connected with? Is your actions going to show it because you can justify anything? We can justify, well, I, I, I love you, and then next week I can't stand you. And then, you know, I was looking on the other day, I got 800 uh, friends on Facebook. And I wonder, like, I, I, you ever hit the unfollow button? My wife's saying, yeah. Does anybody, like, nobody wants to admit, like, yeah, I've done that before. Uh, there's a little check button that you can hit on the right side of anybody's post or anybody's status, and it says unfollow. And, and I don't really typically like to follow a lot of negativity, so if you're the type of person that puts a lot of negativity, you can almost guarantee that I'm not following that, right? And, and so I, I looked on my friends the other day, and, and it said I had 800 friends, and I'm thinking, I know I don't have 800 friends. And I just feel like the Lord was saying, you know, do you know how many people's unfollowed you for your post that you put about God? And, and, and do you know how many people's unfollowed you? Not everybody's your friend, right? Not everybody's your friend, right? right? But listen, you need to be a friend and a neighbor to everybody because of the connection you have with Jesus. 
You need to be. Why? Because there are people waiting to hear about Jesus and only you might be the only light they may ever see. Listen, our neighbor, this is my second point, our neighbor is every single human being alive. Every single human being alive. Y'all get that? Every single human being alive. I grew up in a home um, that, that not... We went to church, but my mom and dad did foster care for about 30 years. And I remember when my mom and dad first got into foster care... Um, there was, and, and please stay with me till the end of the story. Don't get up and run out of the church thinking that, that my family's a racist family or anything. Just hold on, right? Um, when, when I went to school at Holmes High School, um, it was 40, 50% uh, black or white. It was very mixed. Um, I had a lot of friends that were black. Um, you know, I mean, I, I can, when every job I've ever worked at um, when I lived in, in, in that area um, always had a mixture of people. In Grant County, you don't see that as much, right? And, and when I grew up in Covington, um, I remember that my house was a little bit different. We went to church. We had things that were going on. But I remember when we got into foster care, I remember there was this one-liner that they gave my mom and dad. Um, Is there any children you wouldn't want? And without hesitation, without hesitation, my dad says, we don't want any black children. And I remember my dad coming home and telling me that. And me, I'm thinking, why wouldn't we want a black child? And my dad just like, well, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't know why. Huh. That was like that for about eight years. And then I remember sitting in a boat down in, um, I remember sitting in a boat down in Alabama with my dad. And my mom called, right? She's like, guess what? I'm like, what? She said, we just got a little boy named DeMarco. And I'm like, I don't know any white kids named DeMarco. This is going to be interesting. And I'm already out of the house, right? And, and, and so my, my mom says, hey, you need to tell your dad what I've done. This little boy needed a home, and, and, and his brother Kenny's coming too. And, and uh, he was going to tell your dad. So I got off the phone, right? And I'm like, all right, this is going to be awesome. Hey, dad, yeah, guess what? There's black kids living in your house now. Isn't that awesome? My dad's like, what? I'm like, oh yeah! Oh yeah, we're a mixed family now. Praise the Lord, Dad, it's awesome. And, and, and so my dad wasn't as happy with my mom at all. And he went home and he's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is crazy. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he got home and all of a sudden, like a month or two months later, Kenny, uh, which is, is, was, a, was a mixed boy, was everywhere I see my dad go, Kenny was right there. And my dad starts to like love this kid. And I'm like, Dad! What's going on? I thought you didn't like this type of race. And my dad's like, man, I was so racist. Like even justifying, saying, he said, I didn't have anything against anybody, but I just, you know, I grew up in, in a time frame where it was just the right thing. And it wasn't right. And my dad grew a love for these two boys. And, and I just thought it was amazing. And then when me and Linda went into foster care, uh, one, you know, one of the, it wasn't the first kids we had, but we had Angelica, and we, you know, we had Jessica, and those two kids still keep up with me and Linda, and, and you know, the, they were a mixed, you know, couple, or a mixed, uh, you know, kids, and, and I look at that, and I think, look what God's done in my family, from growing up to being an expectation of no black kids allowed, to my dad walking through Walmart one day in Dry Ridge. And a security guard came up to Kenny and said, can, can I help you uh, with something? And he thought he was there to steal something. Because this has been some years back, folks. And my dad walks up and he's like, listen, he ain't here. He's with me. And he ain't here to steal nothing. Why are you thinking that? Because he's black? And I'm like, dad, that would have been you like 10 years ago. <laughs> like, why are you giving the guy a hard time? He said, it ain't right. And I'm like, I know it ain't right. But see, folks, we can justify a lot of stuff. Every single human being is our neighbor. No matter if it lives in Dry Ridge, or if it's in Jamaica, or if it's in Grenada, or if it's in Ethiopia, every single human being is our neighbor. And we're expected to take the mission field to every single person. Doesn't matter. 
I've grown a love and respect for, for, for Manuel at the Mexican restaurant. Every time I go in there, last night I was in there, Manuel comes up and he's like, scoot over. <laughs> you know what I'm like, like? Like me and Autumn's already sitting in a chair and there's like this much room. He's like, scoot over. And he gets in there and he talks to us for like five, ten minutes. Why? Because that's the relationship I had with Manuel. I love him. He's my neighbor. Amen. He is. And that's why that I want to share one thing with you as a pastor. I cannot stand is when somebody comes to me and says, you know, why can't we just take care of people in Grant County? Why can't we just take care of people in the United States? And why do we always got to feel like we got to go abroad? And why, why, why can't we spend the money, you know, just on our kids or in our neighborhoods? Or why can't we do more ministry just in Williamstown and not all of Grant County? And I, I, that's the dumbest thing I could have ever heard. Why? Because there's 78 churches in, in Grant County. There may be a village in, in Grenada or Ethiopia or Jamaica or any other place that might not have any churches. All they may have is be living in shacks and then we wonder, like, why are we like that? Because our education and knowledge base is not enough to know that every single human being alive is our neighbor. Right? And I'm going to tell you, Jesus was hitting this church godly expert right in the face with this point. And he went on farther. He went on just a little bit farther. You have to understand, the priest and the, and, the, and the Levite, they were considered to be the godly example of that time. If you were a priest or if you were a Levite, you were expected, I mean, to have a godliness about you, to have the blessing about you. All right? But if you were a Samaritan, not so much. Not so much. The Samaritan was a whole group of half-breed Jews. Completely different group. Josh reminded me that after my first sermon. He's like, you know that they were like half-breed, like Jewish. That's why they hated them. They also hated them because they were, uh, uh, they were, it was said that they took human bones and they desecrated, basically made a mockery out of the temples uh, of God and of the Jewish people because they were hated. It was kind of like the Hatfields and McCoys going on. And Chance reminded me after the first sermon, he said, do you realize that literally when the priests and the Levites or anybody that was a Jewish person, they, they would not even walk through where the Samaritans would live. They would walk around purposely just so they wouldn't have to deal with the Samaritans because they hated them. Now think about it. Jesus is telling a story about a good Samaritan. This is not a person that was a good Christian person. He was using this to throw it right in the face of the godly people to say, if you don't love people and have, have a, you know, a, just a heart for people, I mean, other than just yourself, then you're really not all that godly anyway. And it's all in vain. And one thing I love about this story is going from Jerusalem to Jericho because Jerusalem was the place where they did all the worship services. Right? And it was like if you went to Jerusalem, you were going there to do the rituals of, of the Jewish people. So when it says that they were going from Jerusalem to Jericho, it meant that they were going back home. They were headed back home after they had did all these rituals. And do you ever feel like when you go to church, you leave just a little bit more godly? I know I do. I leave church. If I miss church like any time, I leave feeling better. You know, and, and if I don't go to church, I feel it in my soul. Like, man, I really miss church this week. And I heard somebody tell me that, like, you know, yesterday it says, felt like we haven't been here in a month and they missed one week to go on a little vacation with their family. That we feel like we haven't been here in forever. So these people, the, the priests and the Levite, they were leaving church. They did all their stuff to be godly and they were going home and walked right past someone in great need. Life-threatening need. And he says, but the good Samaritan was passing by and did something about it. The good Samaritan passed by. Listen, can I tell you, this is another point I have for you today. Jesus is our redemption. So we must be the redemption to others so that all may know Christ. Jesus is our redemption. He, he saved us for a greater purpose other than ourselves. He saved us so that we might be a light to the world. We are the redemption to others so that they may come to know Christ. Now, I'm not saying you went and you died on the cross. But I'm going to tell you, for this guy that was laying on the side of the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, these, the Samaritan that stopped by, it was his redemption. 
He was his Jesus in that moment. Had that guy went on by, that guy might have literally laid there and died. And do we not care about people that are laying on the side of the road? And you know what? Who, who is the person on the side of the road? It's every single person in need as you stroll by. Like if you leave church today and you came in and you did your ritual thing and you stood up here saying, I'm going to change the world. We're going to be the generation that does it. And you stand up here and you're singing and you're shouting and you're doing it in sync and you leave out of here. And you walk by a hundred people in need because you've got somewhere else to go and something else to do. Now Jesus says, well, listen, you're no different. You're no different than the priest and the Levite who are doing every single thing right, but you're not loving your neighbor as yourself. There's an allegorical meaning. And I don't know if you know what allegorical meaning means. I mean, I don't even mess with a, you know, a lot of stuff like this because um, a lot of times I think people just make this stuff up. But this, this right here, what I'm getting ready to tell you, was actually taught and shared in the church for a couple thousand years. Like everybody after Jesus, when Jesus had went and he left and they started church up, when they taught about the Good Samaritan story, they taught the people this meaning. This is what it really means, just so you know. So I'm going to read it to you. Let's listen to it for a second. The man who was going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, that man on the road that got jumped, that was like Adam. Jerusalem, which is where the man Adam just left, was considered paradise. Or the Garden of Eden. Jericho, which that's where the man was, is going, is considered the world. Because when he got kicked out of the garden, he entered in what we would consider the world. The robbers are considered like the demons of darkness. They are to kill, steal, and destroy. The priest, which the law can only do so much for you, the priest is considered the law. And all it is is just statements about what you, can, what you have to do and can't do. But it doesn't show the mercy. The Levite is the prophet. The good Samaritan that actually comes to help is Christ. The inn, which that's where the good Samaritan takes this guy, which accepts all who wish to enter, is considered the church. Everybody's welcome here. The manager of the inn is the pastor of the church to whom its care has been entrusted. And the fact that the, the, the Good Samaritan promises he will return represents the Savior's second coming. Because Jesus says, I will be back. <coughs> so I want you to think about that story. In this story, Jesus knew the guy, the expert of the law, enough to know, listen, I'm going to talk on simple terms, on simple meaning. I'm going to lay it out there to say, listen, love your neighbor as yourself. But when Jesus goes on and tells this parable story, he's saying, I'm going to give you the entire gospel hearing about a paragraph to tell you who Adam was. He got kicked out of the garden. He left paradise. He came to the world. The law tried to save you. The law couldn't save you. The law literally had no way to save you. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes along and Jesus saves you. Jesus says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set my, my, the church is going to be the rock. And then you look at the church and the church's instructions are to literally take everybody in and build them up to know Christ. And Christ says, oh yeah, by the way, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back. And if there's anything that's cost you, I'm going to reimburse you. You can never outgive God, folks, in any area of your life. And most people have never even heard about that allegorical meaning that's been taught in churches for a thousand, two thousand years. Nobody's ever heard of it that it's really talking about Jesus' redemption for mankind. And Jesus says this, it doesn't matter who you are. Every single person is your neighbor. Every single person. Jesus is our redemption. So we must be the redemption to others so that they may all know Christ. Amen. And I'm going to call the band back up here. And i got just a little story I want to share with you about somebody in Harlem. In New York, it was considered um, a good Samaritan by the papers. And I've never heard of the Harlem hero. <laughs> I've heard of the Harlem Globetrotters. Um, but I've never heard of the Harlem hero. And back in 2006, a crazy thing happened on a subway station. Insane situation. A guy by the name of Wesley Autry 
was literally going down to get on the subway to go home with his girls. He had a girl that was four and another girl that was six. And he's walking them down and they're waiting to get on the subway. And as they're standing there waiting to go get on the subway, Wesley notices a guy. And the guy starts having seizures and he falls against a pillar. And when he fell against the pillar, he fell down into the subway railroad tracks. Or subway tracks. And Wesley's standing there and he sees the guy fall down. And the guy, he, he can't jump up and just jump back out because he's had a seizure. And he's laying down in there and he's flailing. And he's standing there with a girl that's four years old. And he's standing there with a girl that's six years old. What do you do? And without even thinking about it, he let go of his girl's hands. He's dead. And he jumped down in there. And when he jumped down in there, he looked up and around the bend comes the lights of the subway. Folks, I don't know if you've ever been to Chicago or to New York or seen the way subways are maybe on TV shows. They roll into the station 40, 50, 60, 70 mile an hour. Then they stop for a second and then they take off again. And when he saw the lights, he realized there's no way I'm going to pick up the guy, get him off the tracks, and get us both safely off the tracks. His two girls were standing up on the platform. He couldn't communicate with them because he had to act fast. So he takes this guy and he's just having a seizure and he pushes this guy right into the center of the railroad tracks. The subway tracks. There's like this little 22 inch indention in the middle of the tracks. Pushes him down. The guy's still flailing. So he jumps on top of him. He's holding the guy down. And hoping that when the subway passes over there's enough clearance. No idea if there was. Threw himself into harm's way. Subway train rolls right over top of his body. And it comes to a stop. And the onlookers up there are freaking out. No clue what to do. And then, Wesley yells up. Hey! There's two little girls up there! I want you to tell them that their daddy is okay. I don't know how they got him out, whether the train went on a roll. I don't think it did. I think they stopped it and somehow got him out of it. Got the guy out. But, they, but listen, this guy threw himself in harm's way while there was another attention. His girls were sitting there and literally, you know Subway. He left, he left every single thing, the safe zone, and jumped down for somebody he had no clue who he was to see if he could help him. Knowing that it might cost him his life, that his girls might actually see him get hit by this train, didn't matter. And they call him the Good Samaritan. They also call him the Harlem Hero. And even after this many years, it's still like you can find it on Google. If you just type up like Harlem Hero, you'll find it just like that. And they did tons of interviews. Even to the point where they got a 3D graphic showing you how he did it. And it says that he had grease stains on his, on his, on his cap where the lines from the subway was hitting him as it went by. But he still lived to tell about it. Folks, listen, I want to tell you, I don't think Jesus is all that complicated. I think Jesus can talk to an expert of the law and give them the whole gospel in a paragraph if that's what they want? Or I think Jesus can talk to someone like me who's very, very down to earth. I don't need you to tell me all your doctor's degree stuff. He is so simple to say, listen, I'm going to make it as simple as possible. Love God and love people. Simple. Love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. And then love people. Jesus did every single thing when he went to the cross for you and for me. He didn't make it that difficult. Love God and love people. So as you leave the service today, as you're on your way back to Jericho or your home, don't pass by people. No matter if you don't like their race, no matter if you don't like what they stand for, I don't care if they're an atheist and they hate the church. If you have an opportunity to be like Jesus, 
to put yourself aside. If you have an opportunity to love them as much as you love yourself, as much as you love your family, even if they don't believe what you believe, you tend to their care. And you give God the glory. And I guarantee you, God will do amazing things through that. Amen? Amen.